And happy Saturday afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the Marketing Corner. My name is Sean Campbell. I'm going to apologize first and foremost because we really need two hours today, David, with our host. Absolutely. You bring it. You bring like the A plus of the A plus of the hey, A plus. you let me know. Oh, my God. Co-host David Bradley, thank you for being here again. Well, I'm proud, proud to be here and a pleasure and honor to be here. You know, guess yeah. who's back? back yeah. again. <laughs> Special guest, Bob Logan. How are you today, Bob? I'm, I'm living the dream every day. Oh, my God. I, I Again, I wake up at 4 o'clock every Saturday morning because I can't wait to get in here. I, got, I wish I would have trolled you this morning instead of during this week because I cannot wait for today. Oh, yeah. good. I cannot wait. I know we've been talking a little bit. I've been kind of quiet, qu- kind of reserved because I want to save as much as our discussion for our audience today. Audience, no, today's going to be epic. Yes, it's gonna, yeah, yeah. You know, it scared me here. You're setting a pretty high, high bar. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a huge yeah. fall. <laughs> it's going to be a huge disappointment. We'll all fall together, my friend. <laughs> I have faith in you, Bob. If and when, uh, audience, if you if and when you have a question, 520-790-2040, 520-790-2040, give us a call with your questions. Mr. Logan, the first thing I want to get into uh, when I was doing my research on you, you and I are Air Force brats. Oh, Really? And okay. I, yeah, I see that as a thread amongst your uh, and how it's influenced your career. No doubt. My friends are tired of me, you know, discussing how when I was this and I was that. I want you to, like, what made, what part of that experience has held over into your career? You know, the, the, the first part would be seven schools in 12 years. Yep. So no. I, I was born in Montgomery, Alabama. Mm-hmm. Everybody go, oh, really? You're from Al- Alabama? Are you I can tell from your accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I left after a week. <laughs> so I was in Montgomery, Alabama for seven days. Oh, we, wow. We were in the middle <laughs> of a week. <laughs> we were in the middle of a cross-country transfer, believe it or not. Really? From one place, uh, oh, wow. Florida, to Sacramento, to McClellan Air Force Base. And, and my mom was birth. pregnant. We had to stop in Montgomery, have me, and then continue driving <laughs> wow. across the country. So, wow. you know, the, to your point, Sean, mm-hmm. is when you go to different schools every two years, mm-hmm. it is a challenge yeah. because you have to make all brand new friends yeah, and yeah. start from scratch yeah. every couple of years. So yeah. you learn that change is part of my life and change mm-hmm. has been a continuing theme throughout mm-hmm. my entire career. Yeah. yeah no complacency. Yeah. No. One thing, and I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm plugging my book a little bit, right? But one thing that I always say in my book is you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what being an Air Force brat, you know, I love going in the summer that I've never been to before and just walking into a place and just kind of starting a conversation with somebody who's a hundred percent not like me. Right. There's nothing better than that. To right. Me. And you and I, and you too, Dave, we have that ability to do so. Right. And you cannot put a quantitative amount on how much that has led to yeah, not at all. Like some of the success in, yeah. in you as well, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Adaptive Absolutely. Uh, yeah. to your surroundings, right? Yeah. Where'd you go to high school? I went to South Point here locally. Did you? Okay. Yeah. My brother, yeah. on the other hand, he uh-huh. went to three high schools. Wow. He went to a high school in Maine mm-hmm. and a high school in Camarillo, California when we were uh, mm-hmm. at Oxnard Air Force Base wow. and his final two years yeah. were at South Point. Yeah. So he went to three schools. Yeah. I was fortunate. My dad retired here in 68. Yeah. And I yeah. had my full high school career. Any time overseas? No, nope, nope, yeah. only in football, but not, yeah. in, not in Air Force. Yeah, I spent um, most of my life before 18 overseas. Oh, really? I graduated in West Germany. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And one thing, another layer upon that, you know, if you're a military family, I mean, they come from all backgrounds, right? You know, so I, I grew up around everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had the best food in the world. Live, you know what I mean? It's just like being a part of so many different cultures. You know what I mean? Has really kind of helped yeah, me. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? So. You know, the flip side, the bad side about being in the right. Air Force background, yeah. Air Force yeah. brat, is I can't remember any mm-hmm. of my friends mm-hmm. from prior to like sixth grade. Yeah. You know, so right. everything up to sixth grade are right. people that I played Little League with, but mm-hmm. I don't have any recollection of, of you know, friends yeah. other than people I used to play yeah. with. Yeah. I think there's one or two people here in Tucson that I went to high school with. And that's it. You know, I never run into them or whatever. So it's just, uh, that is the, the flip right, side, right? right? Right. My cousins, my family, I really don't know my extended family very well at all, right? 
Um, so that is the trade-off, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. So you and I are also Eller graduates. Absolutely. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. So I told you I did a little bit of trolling <laughs> on you. <laughs> that He's kind of creepy, huh? That, <laughs> was, He's right. that was a life-changing <laughs> thing for me because I yeah. came from teaching history mm -hmm. at South Point. I was a world oh, history wow. and American studies teacher. Wow. And I was coaching at the University of Arizona, a graduate mm -hmm. assistant, so I had to get a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. And all of the other GAs are getting degrees mm -hmm. in PE or exercise sciences. And I said, I, I, I don't want that kind of degree. Right. I want a degree where I can do something, do some, with, it. Do yeah. something yeah. with it. So yeah. I, I go into the MBA program, and let me tell you, I didn't know a debit from a credit. Yeah. And to yeah. learn high-end business mm -hmm. was, the first year was really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. but. You know, what I learned about business school, the second year, it's all class projects. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, you know what, delegation is pretty darn important. Yeah. So we'd get a group and I'd say, okay, you're doing the finance, you're doing yeah. the accounting, you're doing the marketing, and I'm going to do the presentation. Yeah. Well, that, that, their, yeah. your, your coaching background, too, That's right. came yeah. in a big play with that. You know, yeah. what, your, know what your skills so are. Yeah. You yeah. Know, know what your skill yeah. set is. Yeah. How did you fall into coaching? Um, and, yeah. I I was on a pretty good football team at South Point. Mm -hmm. We were mm -hmm. ranked fourth or fifth in the state. We lost. We didn't go to mm -hmm. the playoffs, mm -hmm. but um, I loved playing football. Mm -hmm. And uh, my high school coach went to the Air Force Academy to be an uh, oh, offensive wow. line coach. So wow. I, I was recruited, went to the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. I quit in the first year, which is uh, another story that we can mm -hmm. talk about. But mm -hmm. when I came back to start teaching, uh, Ed Doherty is a name if you follow high school mm -hmm. football in this mm -hmm. community. Absolutely. He, is, he yeah. was a legend. And I coached for his final couple of years, mm -hmm. and he was an, um, just a master. Mm -hmm. not, a, not only a master coach, but a master of organization, working with people, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. that kind of led me into this is a path I want to go to, at mm -hmm. least initially. It didn't work out that way long term, mm -hmm. but I spent a good amount of my career coaching. Yeah, well, was some of the biggest lessons that you learned, you know, as the coach. And he's, you learned a lot from Ed. Right. But being in the trenches with your players. You know, what? here's the part that I, and I see if I can do this uh, phrase. Um, talent doesn't win. Mm -hmm. Grit and working hard defeats talent every single time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Teamwork. And, and, and yeah. you know, I coached uh, some amazing players, you know, mm -hmm. all state, all conference, all American players. But the, mm -hmm. the kids that I remember more than anything mm -hmm. are the ones that grinded. You yeah. know, didn't have the best best athletic ability, but boy, they could get the job done because they just outworked everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're having that heart. Yeah. 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 So as you, you know, uh, we got a couple of minutes to the break, but one of the things I want to touch upon in the next segment here is the relationship between sports and business. Sure. Right. You know, Dave and I talk all the time, and I was just saying how, how, much, how tired you are of me probably giving baseball analogies. Oh, I to, love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, so. You know, I mean, I coached youth football for 13 years, you know, not mm -hmm. to the level of college, you know, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. it's that same thing, you know, shaping these kids, you know, at such a young age, you know, and, and, and going to a store, running into them, and they still call you coach. It's That's like, right. oh, I just That's got the right. chills, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, what was the most rewarding, what was some of the biggest lessons you learned coaching those 13 um, years? Patience. <laughs> <laughs> For guys like you and I, that's invaluable. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is. Um, but it, it really goes a long way when you can kind of shape these kids at such a young age. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so see them where they are now, right? And yeah. They're, they're all graduated yeah. high school now, and they're off doing their own thing. It's amazing. Yeah. And they're all gentlemen, I'm sure. Yeah, they're getting yeah. older, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so we got less than a minute going into the break, and we are here with uh, Bob Logan. Again, if you have any questions for any, any of us, you know, related to business, marketing, entrepreneurship, um, how sports relates to all of the above, please give us a call, 520-790-2040. And is there anything that we're going to, any surprises at the the show that you're going to share with us, Bob? I'm, I'm going to follow your lead. I'm going to follow my lead. <laughs> I, so I, we got a few <laughs> surprises in store okay, for everybody. All right. <laughs> so again, 520-790-2040. We are with Bob Logan um, and co-host David Bradley. And so uh, we'll be back here in uh, the next uh, segment here in a couple minutes. Stay tuned. <laughs> We are back with a marketing corner. My name is Sean Campbell, co-host David Bradley, special guest Bob Logan today. Bob, there's so many different topics I want to get into. Um, let's talk about the relationship between sports and business. Okay. Right? How much has 
sports made a, either a positive or maybe a negative influence you on what you do today? Um, it, it, it's pervasive in my mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it's interesting. After I stopped coaching, and I'm now a motivational speaker and, mm-hmm. and an author, um, I s- often would not talk about my sports background because I realized mm-hmm. that a lot of people aren't into sports like I was. Right. Right. And I just recently began to put it in my talks. I've got a I've got a photo of a Kansas City Chiefs huddle. Mm-hmm. All right. And I start off by saying, you know, I know normally don't talk about sports analogies, but when you look in the huddle, you've got a, a big fat guy, you've got a small <laughs> little quick guy, you've got a real smart guy probably. Mm-hmm. And you look at the nature of the huddle, the diversity of that huddle mm-hmm. is actually the diversity of your organization. Wow. With yeah. the exception of women. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And every single one of those players in that huddle come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. They have different skill sets. Mm-hmm. And you've got to train those guys and women mm-hmm. to work together as a team to move forward. Yeah. It's no different than trying to score a touchdown and take that ball and put it over the end zone mm-hmm. than you taking your organization to whatever your goal and your strategy is to move forward. Yeah. So applying those techniques, I think, is really, really valuable. Yeah. One of the biggest, I mean, there's so many things on your website, and you know, we'll, we'll provide that website pretty soon, but one of the biggest things that really hit me is that the most important, the client is not the most important thing, it's your employees. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I learned that a long time because mm-hmm. years ago, the customer was number one. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that may be true, but to integrate and to implement your mm-hmm. business goals, You've got to mm-hmm. have employees that are fully engaged and passionate about the mission. Mm-hmm. So I I hate to say it, the customer is not number one. Your mm-hmm. employee is number one. Right. And you've got to make sure your employees are on the same page as you to create mm-hmm. a great experience for your customer. Yeah, and getting them on the same page, how important is, is it? And I preach this all the time to small business owners. When I And people hate me, not hate me, but they, they get into arguments with me because... Mm-hmm. I don't go to local coffee shops as often because of just the the lack of customer service. It's always inconsistent. You could tell that people just don't care. And I'm not upset with them. I'm upset with their leadership for not, in my opinion, they're probably not providing the vision of what the small business owner wants, you know, to, to it be, you know, their business to be perceived. No, absolutely. How important is it for that leader or that small business owner to share that vision with their employees? Well, and it's got to be really difficult today because we're in a social media Mm -hmm. landscape right now. We don't do physical touch with the customer very much anymore. So when there is an opportunity to have a touch moment, Mm -hmm. a touch point with a customer, you've got to take it spot on. You can't, you've got to take advantage of it. And and you've got to create an experience for that customer yeah. that makes you memorable, right. that makes them want to come back to your organization. Yeah, and creating that experience also buys you a little leeway in case the steak just wasn't perfect, in mm-hmm. case the cheese wasn't, you know what right. I mean? They're gonna go back for the experience, right? Right. So what, what are some of the uh, common, you know, excuses that you hear from small business owners when, you know, they're getting less than a five-star review on their Google on their Google page. Well, here's my point. You you've got to own it, man. Yeah. You yeah. have to own your mistakes. Yeah. I'll give you a quick a quick story from when I was working at the University of Arizona. Mm-hmm. I came into the College of Science from athletics. Ten mm-hmm. years in athletics as a coach, mm-hmm. as an athletic director, as a fundraiser, and I took this job in the College of Science to run their development operation. A place I knew nothing, nothing Completely about. Out of your wheelhouse. Yeah. Way, yeah. way outside yeah. of my space. Because I thought it might be an opportunity for me. If I succeeded here, that'd be a pretty good story in an interview for another better job down the road. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going through all my files, all these donors that I have in my files. And I find this file of Lola White from Phoenix. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she made a $25,000 gift many, many years ago to fund an endowment for a graduate fellowship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm looking at the paperwork and the documentation, and it's like, oh, my God. Uh, It was worth, the endowment was now worth like $300,000. Wow. (laughs) And and I'm trying to find, okay, well, who the, where's the string of students that Mm -hmm. have been awarded the the fellowship? Mm -hmm. It had never been awarded. 
So wow. what happened, that $25,000 had remained invested uh -huh. for like 25 years, wow. and it had grown to this massive amount. But I realized we had never delivered on producing a student that she funded. Uh, uh. So here I am in my first couple of weeks going, well, this is going to be fun. This is going to change. <laughs> but you, you, here's what I learned. I called Lola up. I said, Lola, my name is Bob Logan. I'm the new development guy at the College of Science. I've got some really good news. I've got some bad news, too. Mm -hmm. She goes, well, what's the good news? Well, your endowment's very substantial. You've got mm -hmm. about $300,000 in this endowment. Mm -hmm. And the bad news is we've never awarded a graduate fellow. Wow. She goes, you know, I've been waiting. Wow. I've been trying to get a hold of people oh, all these years. Wow. Nobody's ever called me back. Nobody's ever talked to me. Wow. You're the first person that's responded. There's another 25 grand. Yeah. <laughs> she did. So she's no a, she's a multi-million dollar donor to the university. Oh, I may wow. be off on the numbers a little bit, yeah. but here's yeah. the point. All she wanted to do is be heard. Yeah. She wasn't angry. Yeah. She just wanted to be heard. She wanted yeah. to be listened to. Yeah. And I think sometimes we make excuses about our mistakes, mm -hmm. but most people, if you own the mistake and tell them, I am terribly sorry, this yeah. is not going to happen again, yeah. they're yeah. going to give you a pass. Yeah. It goes a long way. Yeah. 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 In Say my, your story. Yeah. In my industry, Bob, in, in, in marketing, the number one reason why we would lose a client it's not because of a perceived bad ROI on their investment with us. It's not, you know, bad metrics or bad data or whatever. It's the customer or my clients thinking that they're not, that they don't mean anything to us. Right. You know, and sometimes it just takes a, a call just saying, hey, how you doing? You know, how's your daughter doing? And this? Oh, I just want to let you know this and we're adjusting. You know, retention is one of those things in any business where I think it's a very underappreciated metric. Right. It's a lot more expensive to find a new customer or client than it is just to keep your own client. Oh, absolutely. You know and what I'm I mean? gonna I'm gonna touch on something you mentioned during the break. Mm -hmm. Um it's important that you make that call yep. or go see them face to face. Yeah. Eyeball to eyeball. Yeah. Eyeball because to eyeball. Because too too many yep. young people now they yep. want to send a text or an email. Yeah. And let me tell you, when you get an, an envelope in the mail that is handwritten, a mm -hmm. note guess what? You're going to open that thing up because you don't yeah. see those very often. Yeah. So if you're going to own up to a mistake, you need to respond yeah. in person yeah. or on a phone call, not not yeah. in a text or an email. Yeah, there's something, I think you and I, David, were talking about this the other day when we we're kind of going over some AI stuff, mm -hmm. right? We both agree that AI is necessary today to, to, to be kind of versed in it and know how to utilize it to become more efficient. Oh, absolutely. Efficiency, yeah. Yeah, but nothing beats the ability that you and I and Bob have of being face to face, face, to face. and having conversations. Yep. You know, this show in and itself, this is the first time you and I ever had a conversation, right. Bob. Right. How many people 20, 30 years younger than us could literally meet on and provide this value and information to everybody who's listening right now? Yeah, right. Absolutely. You know? I have no doubt we can do that. The world's going to end because of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary times. <laughs> What's, what was your biggest win as a coach? You know, getting back to the kind of the relationship between sports and business, you know, what, what, what was your biggest wins both on the, on the front of being a coach in sports and your biggest win um, as a leader in business? That's a good question. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to – I will give you a two-part answer. Okay. The biggest win, if you're looking at just wins, okay, yeah. football wins. Um, in 1986, we played Arizona State in the mm -hmm. final game of the year. Mm -hmm. It's a great story, long story. I won't go into it now. But they were, I think, ranked seventh or eighth in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were like 12th. They were already in the Rose Bowl, undefeated. And uh, we upset them 34-17. to 17. This is a game where Chuck nice. Cecil yep. ran yeah. the 106-yard yeah. interception return. I've got to tell you a story during a break about and, that. And I'll <laughs> tell you what, what happened was we were not favored in the game. You mm -hmm. know, We were yeah. a severe yeah. underdog. Yeah. And uh, we convinced our players that we can do this. Mm -hmm. And we did. Mm -hmm. And we dominated the game almost throughout the entire game. Mm -hmm. So that was victory number one. The second victory coaching to business was me going to Italy to coach. Uh, I was a head That's coach, yeah. head coach of uh, the Bologna, what I call them, the Fighting Doves. The the mascot <laughs> were, were doves. Believe it or not, yeah, I believe okay. it. Yeah, I spent some time in on Europe. our helmet. I yeah. tried to put fangs on the dove. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what happened there? I, I was I was coaching in an environment that I was in a different culture. I was in their land, and I yeah. was trying to impose my will 
of coaching at the Division One level at the University of Arizona on mm-hmm. these Italians, mm-hmm. and they were putting their heels in. They, they, yeah. I had them come to my my flat and say, "We're we're yeah. going to quit. You're huh. you're pushing us too hard." And I'm like, "Are you kidding me? Yeah, Go ahead, football, quit. Man. I don't come care. On. Yeah. yeah, come on." But guess what? I realized that I had to adjust to them. Yeah. Not yeah. them adjust to me. Right. And once once I learned that message, that was very, very powerful because I used that throughout my business t- career that mm-hmm. maybe I'm not right all the time. Yeah. Maybe somebody yeah. else around the table has a good idea, mm-hmm. and maybe we should listen to them, not just the, the, the mm-hmm. guy at the head of the table. Yeah. I'm really glad you shared that story, Bob. Yeah. Um, I remember um, we've known each other, what, I think going on two years now? Mm-hmm. But it, it feels like I've known you forever. Yeah. You know? Uh, you spoke at our agent retreat, agency right. retreat, oh, wow. a couple um, of years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, we were Payson. Payson. Yeah, we had, we were in Payson, and um, it was so powerful. Mm-hmm. It was so powerful. Like you know, we, we needed a guest, right? Mm-hmm. Boom! I immediately thought of Bob. Um, Bob, you're amazing. Oh, you know, well, come on. Yeah, he's I all right. Love you. Yeah. I love he's you, man. Right. Yeah, but the story. <laughs> I mean, but you sh- you shared a lot of stuff and uh, a lot of motivational stuff. I mean, giving mm-hmm. back. Um, I don't know if we have some time to touch on that. You know, the little gift bag, the bag, oh, the blessing bags, yeah, the blessing mm-hmm. bags. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, just amazing, Bob. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We're going to get a motivation after we come out of the break here in a few minutes. But w- would you say that your style of leadership and coaching is more like a servant? Absolutely. T- yeah. yeah. You know, I've I've watched many young coaches, mm-hmm. and and invariably the young coaches, and also in youth football, you see it a lot of youth football. Mm-hmm. The Vince Lombardi screaming and yelling, yeah, belittling yeah. the players, coming, you know, just yeah. losing their minds. And, you know, players don't respond to that. Right. One time, they will. Yeah. But after that, yeah. they're going to shut you down. Yeah. They, I only they, did that with my son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Well, one, one of the, uh, I was talking about, uh, that I um, was blessed to be part of a uh, presentation this week where an ex-general uh, manager, assistant general manager for a major league team, was talking about the coaching style for Davey Johnson. And he was asking David Johnson, who coached the Mets in the yep. mid '80s, whatever. Like, how do you manage all these twenty-five different personalities and attitudes? Do you remember? I mean, this was you know Keith Hernandez and mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, Lenny Dykstra, Dwight Gooden, Gary Carter. I can go on and on and on. Yeah, twenty-five just dudes, right? Different types of personalities, backgrounds, and everything. David Johnson was like, I don't. I manage maybe four of them, the four big dogs. I keep them in line. Everybody else follows stays. them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was very, very intriguing. He's like, no, I just managed the, the four big ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wonder who they were, you know what I mean? And I was kind of thinking about that this week. But that's something, in, you know, if you're listening out there with your organization, think about that. Who are the guys that you manage that everybody else follows in line? You're listening to the Marketing Corner, and we'll be back. And we are back to the Marketing Corner. Co-host David Bradley. Woo! We need like an audience in here, so when I do this, is like a round of applause. <sighs> you know, <laughs> outside the window. <laughs> and special guest Bob Logan. Before I forget, Bob, what's what's a good way to reach out to you, um, someone who's listening right uh, now? Let me just give you everything. Uh, very easy. My website is uh, www.boblogan.net. Mm-hmm. com. dot net. Mm-hmm. Um, I may actually give you my phone number. I, I used to put Ooh. my phone. I used to put my phone number on the board when I was teaching at South Point. <laughs> and parents go, "Are you kidding me? You give the phone number to your kids? Guess what? They were very respectful. I never, yeah, no never one got a crank. <laughs> <on. laughs> so five two zero three four nine nine one seven one. And I have a book that I published about a mm-hmm. year or mm-hmm. so ago. And there's a landing page for that. That is. Uh, let your path find you mm-hmm. dot com. Mm-hmm. If you're watching this on the podcast, Bob, lift up that book. Is that it right there? Yeah. And put it in front of this camera right here. Right here. No, up this here. One? Yeah, yeah. Right here. So you can see that if you're watching this on a podcast on YouTube or Spotify, you could watch this the <laughs> <laughs> the marketing <laughs> corner hosted by Sean Campbell. So subscribe while you're there too. Come on. Come on. So um, one thing that, you know, there's so many things, you know, as I went through your LinkedIn profile, your, your website, watched some videos, one of the things that I'm most intrigued about in this conversation during this episode is the topic of motivation. Okay. Speak to us about this. Oh. Yeah. Just, just what, what, what's something that the first step in, as a leader of an organization, a coach of a team, how do you motivate people? Um. You know, one of the things that I really tried to do is work with my 
not only players and teams but organizations and mm-hmm. and, and workers is try to be in their space mm-hmm. try to understand what they're going through so i'll do an exercise at a, at a talk that i'm giving and i'll say look i i'm not going to call anybody out and find mm-hmm. out specifics but raise your hand if you've gone through a bankruptcy Mm-hmm. or if you've dealt with somebody with cancer mm-hmm. or you've gone through a bad divorce or you've um, you know, had to take the keys away from your parents that are, can't drive their car, all those things. Mm-hmm. And I, it takes a couple minutes. And then I say, okay, now look around the room, raise your hand if you raise your hand at any of those things. And guess what? Every single person in the room mm-hmm. has issues. Mm-hmm. Everybody has problems. And so the point as a leader is to have empathy for your employees. So mm-hmm. if you've got a problem employee, there may be something going on behind the scenes right. that you really don't know about. Mm-hmm. And instead of only look at them as an eight to five person, mm-hmm. you need to get into their space and find out what's going on in their life. Mm-hmm. Because if you show empathy towards them, mm-hmm. guess what? They're going to be motivated so much more to work for you. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, in, 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 sorry to interrupt, though. Even if they, they share a story, you know, it might have been something that you went through personally as well. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So working with your people and, and trying to be on their side, you know, the motivation gets – people like to throw that around like being a Vince Lombardi kind of guy. That That's yeah. not what motivation is all about. Yeah. You need to find – help them find the passion – to agree to work hard for your for your group, yeah, yep. or yeah. even find out what really motivates them. Yeah. Right, it might be money for one person, it might be That's something a else. Very for good else. point. Right, very very good point. I took a um, it was like a personality test. I forget the name of it about a year and a half ago. And one thing that I'll be the first in line to admit this: my empathy sucks. My I don't have <laughs> em- too. I don't have empathy for. I've been told that several yeah, times. <laughs> yeah, so when I see a dude walk in five ten minutes late every day, and I'm just like. You know, back in my mind, it's like, why are you late all the time? You get the opportunity to work here, just the best place ever, blah, blah, blah. You get all these benefits, right. you get good pay, blah, blah, blah. Why are you always late? But to your point, Bob, we, I don't know what's going on. You don't know don't. what's going on. Yeah. 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 So working with your people, I think, is really, really important. Yeah. If you have any questions for any of us, 520-790-2040. David, in your career, you know, what are your thoughts about you know, what has made some of the best people in your industry? What motivates them? What what motivates you? Well, uh, first of all, with the people, I mean, again, going back to what I was saying, mm-hmm. everyone has different aspects of their motiv- getting motivated. Right? right. You know, it's like right. w- one might be money. Mm-hmm. One might be recognition. Right. Um, one might be, hey, just hear me out. Yeah. You know, like you were talking about, you know, wanting to be heard. Yeah. Right. Um, what motivates me is I'm in a career that is very rewarding, um, helping people. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's what really motivates me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always say to every client I sit down with or all my, cl- my current clients, uh, I treat everyone like family, you know, mm, and you do. I remember you speaking, do. thank yeah. you. Yeah. I remember speaking, doing a seminar and I say, listen, <clears throat> I treat everyone like my own mother. Mm-hmm. And then one guy raises his hand. He's like, mm-hmm. Well, it depends on your relationship with your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, great point, sir. Great point. And I'm yeah. like, you know, my mom and I are best friends. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I try but you've always family. been like that. You and I have known each other for 25, 26 years. Yeah. From the very beginnings of your career in yeah, your, farmers, yeah, farmers yeah. insurance, yeah, you back in '96. You know, if you got a call from a policyholder, everything stopped and you'd listen yeah. to them. I remember you just putting your head down and just listening and taking notes. Yeah. You've always been that way. Yeah. You've always been that way. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I learned at working at the University of Arizona, being around so many researchers and so much unbelievable Mm -hmm. uh, knowledge, Mm -hmm. um, employees, blank, broad brush comment here, Mm -hmm. are not motivated by money. Mm -hmm. They're not motivated by titles. Mm -hmm. You know, sure, all that's good, then we all want it, Mm -hmm. but what they're really motivated by is appreciation. Yeah. Is being yeah. able to be, and I, I, yeah. I have a thing uh-huh. called uh, the stop the train moment mm-hmm. where, you know, the, here's an example of, you know, you're sitting on the couch with your son or daughter watching TV, maybe a teenager, mm-hmm. and just mute the TV. Huh. What are you doing, Dad? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, I just want to take a minute. I don't know if I'm going to do this or not. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to take a minute and tell you how proud I am of you. Yeah. You know, what yeah. you've been doing on your project and history or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see how you work with other kids. I just want you to know mm-hmm. that 
I'm so happy to have you as my son or daughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can do that same thing with your employee. You know, yeah. they're working on a project. You pull them in and say, hey, nothing going on. I just want to let you know you are kicking A on mm-hmm. that project. Yeah. And you can't imagine how much energy you buy from that employee by giving them a tap on the back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. goes yeah. a long way. Yeah. I want to be a little vulnerable here to you guys and the audience. I don't know, can't believe I'm going to say this, but one of the things that motivates me is, and, and I, I hate failure. I hate losing. But when, once I get off that mat, watch out. Watch out. There's nothing more that motivates me than trying to prove somebody wrong. Yep, absolutely. And, and I know this isn't healthy. I've been told by many people, you're not yeah, healthy, yeah, Sean. Yeah. But that chip on the shoulder, oh, dude. I mean, don't 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 get me mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, you oh. know, tell me no and I what hate, happens. I hate losing. Yeah, you have too. no idea. I mean, you know, I, I, I appreciate everything. I appreciate the small wins and everything. But failure motivates me. Right. You yep. know? Right. And I know I'm not... I'm probably an outlier. I know I'm an outlier in that aspect. But, man, once I dust myself off, watch out, man. But on that topic of failure, let me just say this. Too many people, A, are afraid to take risk. Yeah. Yeah. They're afraid to try to get out of their comfort zone because you need to get out of your comfort zone to find success. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't understand that failure is part of the process to get to success. Right. Absolutely. And too many people think failure is a noun i.e., oh, I yeah. am yeah. a failure. Yeah. No, it, it's not a noun. Right. It's a verb. You right. happen to fail in a specific situation, and it's over. Yeah. Just move on. Yeah, learn yeah. from it. Yeah. Yeah, real learn. quick before we get into the break, I was part of a panel discussion a few weeks ago at the, at the College of Eller. Oh, good. It was, it was a career day, right? And so um, a young lady raises her hand, and that's what she was saying. It's like, what if I fail my first job, Right. And I was sitting next to two corporate people, and then there's me, right? So I interjected right away and said, and I was like, good. Yeah, good. good. That's right. It's like, don't be afraid of failure. In fact, I promise you, you're going to fail at your first job. Oh, yeah. And you will be all right. I promise you that. You know, you're here and you're brave enough to ask that question in front of all of us. What if I fail? You show some vulnerability. And I could just tell in your eyes you will succeed. Mm-hmm. And that just glows. She just glowed and she was gushing. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah I, I have that yeah. saying too for myself. Yeah. It's like, do it yeah. afraid. Yeah. So we appreciate you listening. So we'll be back in the last segment here in the marketing corner. The last segment of the marketing corner already. I told you two hours would have been easy for the three of us today. So before we get into it, I do always want to thank John, our engineer, for making this possible and real easy for us. Uh, David Bradley, sponsor of Medicare A to Z. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Proud um, to be here. Uh, yeah, other sponsors of the show, Candace Eaton of Seaton Photography, Jamar Jordan, tax specialist, Roger LaFay, LaFay Processing, Danny McPadden, Last Bridge Media, Mark Weiss, Sales Performance Strategies. Next week, we got Tyler Lopez from Lopez and Lopez Realtors, co-hosted by Mark Weiss. And the, the last uh, question um, to kind of lead us into this segment, Bob, you know, you do a number of, you know, um, motivational appearances to right. companies, right. And, you know, as a coach. And what do you do for yourself when you're not just feeling 100% optimal, when your mindset is a little bit off? You know, I'm a, I, I'm a perennial student. And mm. even when I was coaching, you know, this is back in the days before their YouTube and all the, the resources. I bought football books. I learned oh, wow. a lot of football out of reading books. So even today, I'm just a student of what I do. Mm -hmm. And I love researching and finding stories that I might be able to fit into my talks. As an example, Simone Biles just had this amazing gold medal vault in Paris, Mm -hmm. right? And I came across this video of the gold, and I'm going to tell your listeners to go find this video, Mm -hmm. the 1956 Melbourne Olympics, the gold medal vault, Go take a look at what that looks like. <laughs> the difference the from that right, yeah. to today is amazing. Mm-hmm. And you look at that and you say, I don't think I can ever improve. I don't think I can ever get better. Well, guess what? From there to there, um, you can get better. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like we have a, a someone who's calling in uh, with a question. Uh, John, are we ready, ready to take this phone call? We got Carla on the line. Carla, first, thank you for calling in. What's your question? Hi. Well, I really address myself as 
a crazy grandma, Carla. Mm-hmm. Because I'm because I'm David Bradley's mom. Are you? Hi, mom. He is blushing. <laughs> he is so proud right now. Uh, uh-huh. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hello, uh, Carla. Hi. <laughs> hi. No, your show is great, oh, and I've you. been listening. And I use that crazy grandma Carla to drive my um, youngest grandson up the wall. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. He he rolls his eyes. And I've used it more than one. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, I just want to tell you, you guys are terrific, and I love listening to you. Okay. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Mom. I'll pay you when I see you. Later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Thank bye, you, Mom. Carla. That was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah, I'm beat red. <laughs> <laughs> That was a special moment. We that's had right. There, that's right. Yeah, I just told special. her. I said, make sure you tune in and listen. You know. Yeah, yeah. I love the feedback you give me from your mom every show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, she loves it. That's cool. <laughs> so, uh, getting back, what, what do you do when you have somebody like up here? I Even mean, if you know a fellow small business owner, somebody that's just you know um, that's hit a wall. You know, I mean, you kind of explain what you do, Bob. But you know, what are some of the things that you do to kind of pick them up and brush them off a little bit well again going back to when i do speaking yeah um i have some talks that are kind of boilerplate they on happiness or comfort zones or fear of failure it, again going back to what i mentioned earlier get mm-hmm. into their space and get into their head and find out where are your problems right now mm-hmm. what are the issues that you're dealing with right now and how might I be able to address those issues and problems, mm-hmm. either through a retreat or a talk or, or yeah. whatever? Um, getting people to talk. And, yeah. and one of the things I yeah. learned when I was raising money for my career is the sign of an amazing meeting with a donor, okay, is not saying a word. Huh. Yeah. Because guess what? Most people enjoy talking. They want to talk about themselves. Yep. They want to hear their voice. Yep. And I had so many meetings with donors, and I, mm-hmm. with young development people, they meet with the donor, and they just whip out the proposal and yeah. put it in front of yeah. them, and it's an awkward moment. Yeah. You want the donor to talk about what their wishes, desires, and passions are, yeah. and let, let the voice flow out of them, yeah. and then I try to find a project or a scholarship or a building that might be a match for them. But guess what? Mm-hmm. Donors control the process, not mm-hmm. the development people, not the salespeople. Mm-hmm. They should be listening to their, their uh, the constituents yeah. and their clients yeah. a lot more. Yeah, in any type of sales situation, I always preach, you, you do about 20% of the talking. Exactly right. right. You know, if you're doing more, if you do 21%, Too you're, much. you're not going to close the sale. You're not going to close the sale at all. So that's uh, just... I had a faculty member that, um, I had a donor that provided some support for speech, language, and hearing sciences. And this faculty member did some research in Mm -hmm. neuroscience, and I thought they'd be a really good fit. I said, hey, let's get together with this donor. I think he might be able to fund your program. Mm -hmm. So the the faculty member says, you know what, Bob, you don't need to go. So I set him up at Blue Willow, and they went to lunch at Uh Blue Willow. And I was all excited. So, you know, Mm -hmm. 3 o'clock, I called the faculty member how to go. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! Unbelievable! He loves everything I'm doing. <laughs> I think I think we're going to get a hundred thousand dollars out of this guy. Mm-hmm. I said, "Wow, wow, okay, good job, good job." So I called the donor, and I said, "How did it go? This is the worst meeting in my life." Wow! I said, "What are you wow. talking about?" He said, "I didn't shut up. I didn't <laughs> say a word." The yeah. faculty member talked for an entire hour, and yeah. so that was a that was a really important thing to mm. listening is the important. Thing on your on your head, yeah. your ears are really important. Yeah, John, do we got the other caller on the line right here? We got Billy Bear Netherton, one of my wow, favorite dudes. Good memory. <laughs> What's going on, my man? You know, talking about you know big big failures in our community. I'm one of them, and I got to no, tell you, you are that. not. First of all, I, You're an inspiration. I'm enjoying man. the show very much, but but what I wanted to say, Sean and Bob, is that. You know, I was so afraid to fail for so many years in my mm-hmm. life growing up, and that my, my motivating factor was to wake up and say, I can't fail, I can't fail, I can't fail. But, mm-hmm. man, failing is the best thing that ever happened to me, mm-hmm. and, and multiple times, because I just realized, as a business owner, you've got to be resilient, and you got to show up, and you got to stay positive, and, 
I just wanted to put that out there. There's there's so much to talk about, but I'm just really enjoying the conversation you guys are having right now. But as you both know, I love to hear my voice as well on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing, uh, Bill, you and I have known each other for nearly a decade now, and I don't think you've ever really we, – we've had so many tremendous conversations, right? Bill Netherton is one of the reasons why I wanted to get into podcasting and radio show. Because nice. he was one of the guys that just having a beer and just the lessons I learned from the person who's on the phone right now with us, mm-hmm. Bill Netherton from Professional Bartenders Unlimited. Well, he's Thanks, he's man. a tremendous inspiration. But, Bill, one thing you've never said to me is that you've ever been af- afraid of failure. I, oh, man. You've never I said mean, that literally, to I, yeah. yeah, seriously. That's yeah. one of the things. I I was afraid to fail for so many years, and I it, it's a, it actually hinders a person. It, it'll, it'll freeze you up, and it'll keep you from actually performing at your all your best possible levels because you're so frozen with the concept of fear when Mm -hmm. if we try to embrace it which sounds like the opposite of what you should be doing Mm -hmm. it's it's it will paralyze you and you you won't ever grow yeah Yeah. absolutely billy i mean i think it goes back to even his uh, childhood right i mean we were told and taught you know you know don't fail whatever whatever it was whether it's you know disappointing your parents or whatever the case may be it was instilled at such a young age there's a great thing i put in my talks uh, jeff bezos the former ceo of amazon in his i think it was 2022 annual in his annual report he says we need to increase the number of failures in our organizations Hmm. and i'm thinking wow right how can somebody say that at that Mm -hmm. level the richest man in the world the biggest company in the world his next line is because greater failures lead to greater success. Mm-hmm. So learning it's opportunity. True. Yeah, it's, learning. it's so true, gentlemen. You mm-hmm. know, people say, hey, Billy, uh, I want to give you some advice. I'm like, what's that? He goes, go out and I want you to go out and fail today in something. Just go out and <laughs> fail. And, and yeah. you're going to be better for it. I said, wait a minute. I, isn't that all backward? He said, no. It's actually not backward. It's actually forward thinking. Yeah. Bill, do me a favor. Uh, Professional Bartenders Unlimited. Anybody want to need you? What's a good way to get a hold of you? Yeah, it's really simple. Uh, and thanks for asking, Sean. Mm-hmm. Uh, just go to probartenders.net. Mm-hmm. And remember, Tucson, you can be a guest at your own party. I love it. <laughs> Bill, thank you so hey, much. I appreciate you guys. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I, I love the show, Sean. And I really enjoy uh, today's conversation, gentlemen. Yeah, we, we appreciate awesome. you so much, Bill. Thanks, thank Bill. You. That just gave me the chills too. I know, I know. He's one of the best dudes I've ever, yeah, ever absolutely, you know, absolutely, isn't he? He is. You know, I mean, he gives you the big hug. I can't he's wait genuine. to meet him. He's there. He, he's he's so authentic, you know. But I've never heard him say that to me. You know, I've known him for ten years, and right. You know, we get down into some serious conversations about everything, mm-hmm. right? But he's never admitted that. I feel like I have a. You just did on your show, I, man. On my show, I feel I'm. Yeah. I'm a little over arrogant today. <laughs> so you're not failing today. You're not failing today. Today was today. a win. <laughs> today was a win. <laughs> Absolutely, Bob. I want you to plug your book. You have okay. a different book out here, and I want you to give some last words here in the two minutes. So we have oh, left. geez, you're gonna give me a full two minutes? I can't. Yeah, I can't yeah. talk more than two minutes. Oh, it's geez. impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. Well, my book is called "Let Your Path Find You," and mm. People always ask me, hey, what's your book about? And it's kind of interesting because um, I started this project six years ago. It took me six years to write this book. And I was at a conference in Puerto Rico, and some guy gets on the stage. It was a speaking conference for universities. And the guy gets up on stage, kind of a snake oil salesman, and he starts saying, hey, if you're going to be a speaker, you got to have a book. Mm. And at that time, I didn't even have a website. I hadn't given Mm -hmm. a talk yet. I Mm -hmm. had not started. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I wanted to do was a book. Well... It took a long time to get it done, but yeah. many of these speakers, and I'm not trying to belittle speakers in general, but if you've mm-hmm. probably been there, you go to a conference, somebody talks, and they're selling their book from the stage, and yeah. and they're usually kind of thrown together. Or the platform or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. This yeah. book has some content. It's a memoir. Um, it talks about the Camino de Santiago, which I've walked three times. Yeah. And the chapter titles are Fear, Failure, Challenge, Change, Adversity, mm-hmm. Leadership. It's an awesome yeah. book. And you yeah. can jump around anywhere yeah. you want. And the final thing I'll say is there are QR codes in there. Yeah. And I'll tell a story. You can take your phone and you can watch a video about that story. Mm-hmm. So it's an interactive book. You know, it was meant to be that Bob was on here because one of the things, we're talking about the chip on my shoulder. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I said, you know, this is it. I'm never going to work for anybody again was somebody that told me that it wasn't in my path. 
There you go. And what's the name of your book? Yeah, let, let your, your path, path find, find you. you. Absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's a great book because it's, it's a, com- uh, a combination of just so much stuff. Mm-hmm. It is. Know, that you just yeah. put together. I mean, you're coaching the, the, the Walk of the Camino. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm halfway through it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm yeah. gonna to admit. I, I know there are not enough photos in there for yeah. you. But. Yeah. So, everybody, thank you for listening to the Marketing Corner. Please tune in uh, next week, same time, same place.